Today I'm talking with Dr. Mark Goulston. We talked about a ton of stuff today, but here are a few of the highlights. Uh, we talked about how Mark dropped out of med school twice and still became a doctor, how he was a part of the Breakfast Club with Larry King, the legendary Larry King, his one-man show about Steve Jobs, which he uh, performed for at least a year, and his involvement in the O.J. Simpson murder trial, and a bunch more. I think you're gonna like Mark, real easy guy to talk to, and super, super knowledgeable. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the How Did Happen podcast, powered by Winject Studios. Before I tell you uh, all about my guest, Dr. Mark Goulston, Goulston I, I feel like I need to tell him something first. So I was fortunate to be on his podcast. Um, my Wake Up Call. My Wake Up Call, which I keep forgetting, My Wake Up Call, episode number 324. And I, I've been on a lot of podcasts, and I, I was introduced to Mark from my um, publisher. I think that's how, it, that, that's how that happened, Scribe Media. And I was, so I did his show, and I was just so, I'd never heard of Mark. And I was so taken away by the empathy that this guy has. Like he had so much empathy for me a person he didn't even know had just met um, and was talking to for the very first time. And I, uh, so that could have been just it. You know, I just did the show and I've been like, Oh, okay. You know, but I started listening and, and sort of investigating Mark after, which I don't do with, with many podcasters either. And as I've been listening to his, to his podcast, uh, it's, I just been blown away by how he can connect and I think you use the term sometimes, Mark, to get people to surrender to you because he's got this empathetic, disarming, but at the same time, very engaging and inquisitive way um, about him. So I just wanted to say that to you, Mark, and to my, to my audience first before I say um, you know, more about you and, and your show and before we get into this. So thank you for that gift. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about Mark. So Dr. Mark Goulston is a Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches member who coaches entrepreneurs, CEOs, chairs, and managing directors to become the best version of themselves. He's also an international keynote speaker, helping audiences do the same, and a contributor to some of the most important publications out there, like Harvard Business Review, Business Insider, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you get the picture. Originally a UCLA professor of psychiatry for over 25 years, and from what I understand from listening to Mark's story, it was quite a trip for him to even get there, uh, and a former FBI hostage negotiation trainer, sort of like Chris Voss, I always think of when I hear that thing, he's probably the most person that, uh, that identifies as that most uh, in the media, at least. Mark's expertise has been forged and proven in the crucible of real life, high stakes situations. He is the author or co-author of nine books and his book, Just Listen, has been translated into 28 languages and become the top book on listening in the world. He hosts the highly rated podcast, as I mentioned, called My Wake Up Call, and fun fact, uh, if I have my facts straight, parts of the movie Super Bad, starring Jonah Hill, Seth Rogen, Michael Sarah, Emma Stone, and Bill Hader, were filmed at Mark's home. Do I have that right, Mark? That's what or, makes me memorable to millennials. Okay. Forget about the FBI. Forget <laughs> about uh, being a shrink. Forget about all that stuff. When I when I say they film super bad in my home, they go, oh, my God, really? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we're going to well, we may touch on that just a little bit, um, if you don't mind. Uh, you can find Mark uh, all over the place. He's his uh, website is his name. Right. Mark Goulston. Is that it? Dot com. Uh, LinkedIn. Facebook is Dr. Mark Goulston. Instagram. Mark Goulston. TikTok. 
Dr. M-A-R-K-G, at Dr. M-A-R-K-G. Um, and if you Google him, you'll find out a ton more. You see his TEDx talk, a lot of his talks. He's, he's, he's everywhere. And today he's here. So Mark, thank you for, for joining me on the show. I start every podcast with the same simple question, and that is, how did it happen for you? Well, I've had a long and winding road journey. Uh, I'm in my early 70s. Uh, I started out as a medical doctor, then a psychiatrist, then I expanded, as you mentioned, to hostage negotiation training, then to coaching and executive coaching, uh, high stakes negotiation. Uh, something you didn't mention, probably because we haven't really promoted it, I have a website with uh, my partner called Michelangelo Mindset. And we may do something with it, but I, I, I want to share it with you and your viewers and listeners, because what I realize is my whole life, I have used the Michelangelo Mindset. And if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, if you want to be a successful CEO, if you want to be a successful salesperson, if you want to be a successful husband or wife or mother or father, I think you may adopt it also, because one of the things that Michelangelo famously said is, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved to set it free. Hmm. In fact, there's an article, if you go to Real Leaders, Michelangelo Leadership, uh, it's an article where, where I said, you know, if you're a leader, inside your people is a hunger not just a desire, but a hunger to trust you, have confidence in you, respect you, admire you, uh, feel safe with you, like you, be inspired by you. And what you need to do to set it free is to be trustworthy. Don't lie. Um, instill confidence, have a track record of actually getting stuff done. Uh, cause them to feel psychologically safe, which means that you eliminate bullies and toxic personalities. And when there's a crisis, you take charge of the situation. Uh, and then when the crisis passes, you are more consensus building. Uh, you're respected because you stand up for things and you stand up to people who violate those values. Uh, if you're a salesperson, inside every customer you're having a meeting with is someone who wants to buy something, wants to buy something from you. Uh, every three months, I give a six-month presentation to an accelerator called Expert Dojo. And it's usually about 20, it's a cohort of about 20 startups. And they're early stage, so they've exhausted friends and family, and now they're looking for investor money. And one of the things I present to them, which they seem to like, is I said, inside investors is a desire to give you money. You know, uh, in fact, you're doing them a favor. Sure. Because they don't, they can't sit on their money. They have to invest it. And one of the things that I share with them, which they, they're, you know, they're always looking for because they've heard about it. If you're a startup, or an early stage company and you're talking to investors. Uh, and after three minutes of your presentation, they smile. That's not a yes. Uh, investors don't smile. It's about money. If they're smiling three minutes into your 20 minute presentation, it's because they've already decided it's a no, but you put so much work into that presentation you know, and they don't want to be rude and say, I've heard enough, done, goodbye, pass. So they smile because they don't want you to catch them wanting to be rude. Yeah. So what I suggest to people, now, if your experience is that the smile does lead to them throwing money at you and wanting to give you more than you asked for, well, then this wouldn't apply. But if you've had that experience where three to four minutes into a 20 minute presentation, they're smiling it's because uh, they've already decided it's a no. And if your experience tells you, here's the Michelangelo part of that. 
Inside, they want to give you money. So here's what you do. And here's the exact script. When they smile, whatever you're saying, whatever slide you're on, you pause. And you say, can we stop for a moment? They're going to get nervous because you're on to them. You're going to call them out. Yeah. You, you, you caught them not wanting to be rude. And they're going to sure. go, uh-huh. And then what you say is you say, when we started the presentation, you were listening for something and you didn't hear it. In fact, I'm guessing we're even further away from it than when we started. Can you tell me what you were listening for specifically? Because we actually might have it. We just didn't put it in the presentation because, you know, we, we put the deck together wrong. But if we have it, what you're listening for, or looking for, you know, maybe uh, maybe this could be a, a workout for both of us. Mm-hmm. And then what you say, this is what we say in the accelerator, is you can say, I'll tell you, even if we don't have it, I'm in a cohort of 20 companies. We know each other. We support each other. I might be able to come up with two or three introductions, and then you and they can go you know, on your merry way. You give them money, they succeed. And so what's happened is by using the Michelangelo selling or pitching inside them as a desire to give you money, you just need to surface what they were looking for and listening for. And then if you pivot away from anything that makes you money to introducing them to other startups, those startups are going to be grateful to you. That person who was all set to say goodbye is going to be grateful to you. And you have the possibility of building a relationship as opposed to they're smiling at three minutes and then they allow you to go the 20 minutes and they say something polite and they say, well, you know, uh, send me something, but you know, Mm -hmm. they're gone. But but can you see how, if you take this approach, so I'll, I'll share something else with you. If you're an entrepreneur and a CEO, many times entrepreneurial energy, CEO energy is really alpha. It's very alpha energy. Uh, It runs on dopamine. You know, you tend to be momentum junkies. Mm -hmm. Frequently, that doesn't play well in your personal relationships. And a lot of times what will happen is you will rush your partner who may want an emotional connection with you. And you try to push it into a problem or give them advice that they don't want. Yeah, you're trying to solve a problem that may not exist, in other words. Right. So let me give you some insight that I hope will grab your attention uh, if you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't have that alpha energy. And I'm not being sexist because I've run into alpha female entrepreneurs whose husbands are the ones who tend to be the more softer and more emotional and more connecting type. So this is not uh, in this day and age, this can apply to you, whether you're a male or a female or LGBTQ uh, entrepreneur. So if you've had one of those conversations that goes sideways with your partner, one of the reasons they're listening for a way to connect with you emotionally is frequently they're a little bit frustrated with people in your family, like your young kids. And they're losing their patience with your young kids. And they want to pivot and displace their frustration onto you so that they don't yell at your young kids Hmm. and then have them question themselves. Oh, am I a terrible mom? Am I a terrible dad? And so what they're really wanting is not for you to give them advice or solutions, but you want, you want to, this is dating uh, me, but, Uh, You want to do a Muhammad Ali rope-a-dope. So Muhammad Ali beat George Foreman by just allowing George Foreman to get punch himself up. So what you want to do in an intimate relationship is not give them solutions, but get them to talk even more. And for those of you who like tactics, one of the things you can say to your partner is in a calmer moment is to say, uh, When we have conversations, 
do you want me to give you advice or do you want me to just be aware of what's going on? Because if you just want me to be aware, it'll take the pressure off me and having to come up with a solution when you don't want one. And then mm. I get my feelings hurt because I give you this great advice and you don't want it. <clears throat> Nothing if you happens, just want yeah. me to be aware, then I'll just try to keep you talking till you get it off your chest. Uh, or if you want me to give you advice, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, and very smart. You, yeah. Well, in both of those, in both of those cases, Mark, with that one and with the VCs, it seemed like you were inviting permission for the other person to express what they're looking for from you. Do I did I sense that right? And absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, if you're a game and we've already gotten to know each other because you are on my podcast, I'm going to right here and now give you the difference using you, the difference between you uh, listening to me and you're listening for something. Okay. So right let's do now, it. Let's do it. Yeah. And, and I want you to share with me if you feel a shift inside you. So right now you're listening to me. You're talking to me. You're checking boxes. You're following up with what I'm saying and you're building on it. And we're having, I think, a very pleasant, mutually respectful, I'm talking to you, you're listening to me. But if I were to drill inside what you're listening for, underneath you listening to me, I think what you're listening for, try this on, is you're listening for me to give information that is immediately usable and valuable to your listeners and viewers because your listeners and viewers trust you and have confidence in you. And you want to honor their trust and confidence in you by your bringing them value mm -hmm. that's relevant to their lives that they can use and you may also be listening for, which isn't the case with me because we've already had a previous interview, but you may be listening for maybe a best-selling author who's awful, <laughs> who's terrible, and you have to go back because you have to protect your audience from them. And afterwards, you can say, <laughs> Geez, you know, congratulations on your being on the Wall Street bestseller list, but we can't use the podcast because they were terrible. So he, right, right. Now, now to viewers and listeners, uh, he is laughing because he knows exactly what I'm saying. And so does that, can you feel that that's right, that you're listening for a way to not waste your listeners or viewers time? Hey, everybody, just a quick pause here to let you know how much I appreciate that you've made time for my podcast. If you're not already a subscriber, please become one today. Leave a review and tell a friend. Now, let's get back to the show. As you were saying that, I thought that was very artful, by the way. You had a lot of, you know, your intonation, your facial expression, everything was sort of convincing me to about what you were saying. But I think the thing that I was listening for, and I think you were you were delivering it as well, was I want my audience to have a connection with you. Like I want them to not only have something they can take away, but say, I want more of that. And the reasons they may want more would could be different for, you know, for every person or a lot of people, but I, that's what I really am looking for. Like how do I connect you to them, to their life experience? How do I get them? How, how can I be successful inviting their permission to connect with you through the conversation that we're having? Mm -hmm. So you're not just wanting to honor your listeners and viewers. You're wanting to honor your guests giving you their time. Yeah. And you want it to be valuable, not just to your viewers and listeners, but to your guests. Right. And, and if you can connect them to each other, uh, that's, then, then you feel you've satisfied what you're trying to do. Yeah. So let's build on that on that connection thing a little bit, um, Mark. If you don't mind, let's let's 
Now, I mentioned this sort of road you had, um, you know, to get to um, becoming a psychiatrist. And as I recall, you you had several stints in, in medical school. You were the benefactor of someone's kindness. Uh, and, and I'm I'm interested in 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 having you share that young experience to you as a young person to how you got to to there and why. Okay. Well, Mike, uh, at the risk of alienating your alpha uh, momentum driven listeners, um, one of my greatest accomplishments and I've had a long life and I've accomplished a bunch, but something that I've accomplished that I don't know of anyone else who has is I dropped out of medical school twice and finished. I don't know anyone who dropped out of medical school twice and finished. And I didn't drop out to see the world and to go, you know, uh, be a stand-up comedian. I think I had untreated depression. So what happened is I reached a certain point in medical school, dropped out. They allow you to drop out. A lot of, you know, a lot of people take a year off because they're stressed out. And I worked in blue collar jobs, which to this day I love. I mean, they were so simple. I would just go put in my time. I'm done at five. I, I romanticize those blue collar jobs. What were they, Mark? What were the jobs? Well, my favorite one was, uh, I worked for a liquor distributing company and I put up displays in liquor stores and put up Heineken windmills and bars. Mm. And so I'd be climbing up these rickety ladders, seeing dead rat skeletons on the top of a bar in South Boston. And I loved it. I mean, I would be talking to the barkeep. I'd be talking to the customers. I loved it. And, and then I'd, learn negotiating because I would say, okay, if you keep this neon sign up in your bar for a month, I'll give you a second one to put in your basement. Because a lot Mm. of these people who own these stores and bars, I I worry that they're going to get some kind of cancer. You go into their basement, you can't see yourself. They, They have 93 lights and displays and things. So you'd be bartering with them, you know? And yeah. Okay. And so I love that. And then I came back and my mind went back to where it was in six months. So I asked for another leave of absence, but this time what I didn't realize is that schools, medical schools, I don't know if it's true of law schools, but they lose matching funds when you take a leave of absence. Tuition Mm. doesn't cover the cost of educating you. So I met with the head of the school and he cared about funds. And uh, I don't even remember the meeting with him, but I got a call from the Dean of Students who cared about students. And I was at a low point. And I come from a background where, you know, my dad was a product of the depression and you're only worth what you do. If you can't do anything, you're not worth much. Yeah. And so the Dean calls me in, Dean of Students. He says, I have a letter from the main Dean, read it. And the letter said, I met with Mr. Goulston. We talked about alternate careers. I'm advising the promotions committee that he be asked to withdraw. I said, what does this mean? The dean of students said, you've been kicked out. And it was my good fortune. Um, I don't really believe in miracles, but something miraculous happened when he said that. I felt it was like a gunshot wound. I kind of folded over. I, uh, my, I, my cheekbones were wet and I thought I was bleeding. I kept looking at my fingers, like I was bleeding from my eyes Mm. and it was tears. And so imagine hearing this, and this is probably why I went on to become a suicide prevention expert. So you feel you're kind of useless and you're about to be thrown away. And this is what the Dean of Students said to me. He said, Mark, You didn't mess up because you're passing everything, but you are messed up. But if you became unmessed up, I think this school would be glad they gave you a second chance. So at that point, I just started crying because he was he was pummeling me with compassion. 
And then he hit me with the trifecta, which is what I used with suicidal patients for 25 years, and none of them died by suicide. And the trifecta is he, he saw value in me, just for me. He saw a future for me. And he was willing to stand up to the medical school, uh, stand up against them. And he said, Mark, uh, even if you don't become unmessed up, even if you don't become a doctor, even if you don't do anything with the rest of your life, I'd be proud to know you. Hmm. So he hit me with that and I just started sobbing. And then he said, I'd be proud to know you uh, because you have something that the world needs. And uh, we don't grade it in medical school. Uh, but you won't know how much the world needs it till you're 35, but you've got to make it till you're 35 and you deserve to be on this planet and you're going to let me help you. So the trifecta was he saw that I had something of value in me, uh, that I had a future. And he stood up to the medical school and say, we're going to give this one a second chance. So I took a year off. I grew up in Boston uh, went to med school in Boston, went to undergraduate school at, at, at UC Berkeley. And during that time off, I went to Topeka, Kansas, your neck of the woods, mm. a little south of you. And I went to a place called the Menninger Foundation, which is a big psychiatric institute. It's now, I think, based in Houston. And I guess what he saw was there because I was able to get through to schizophrenic farm boys when I grew up in a suburb of Boston. So knowing that I had some kind of knack, you know, allowed me to take that time off. I went back, finished med school, went to UCLA, finished psychiatry training there. And then I went out and a big part of my practice was suicide prevention. And I just paid it forward. Hmm. People would come to me and I would see something worthwhile in them that they didn't have to do anything for. I could see a future for them that they couldn't see. And I grabbed them by the nape of the neck psychologically and said, you're not going anywhere. And what was, so this 25 years, not a single patient died of suicide, although they were all at least <clears throat> in some way suicidal when they came to talk to you. What was, what was the conversation Mark, I mean, the, 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 what was the path? I mean, we had talked earlier about this ability that you have, and I've heard you talk about this, to have people surrender to, to you. Was it just about having, I mean, I know there was a lot of clinical stuff in it that, that maybe I won't get, well, but well, I'm just well, wondering, what's the, what, what was the secret well, I think the secret, and I have to realize this is the secret of me as a practicing psychiatrist who did psychotherapy instead of medication, is when people came in, uh, one, of the, one of the great for good fortunes of my career is that when I uh, finished training, a fellowship I was supposed to go into got canceled. So I said to myself, well, I'll just go out there and see if I anyone comes to me. And one of my mentors was one of the leading pioneers in suicide prevention. So he's the one who kept referring me people. And, and because I didn't work in an institution, I didn't have to check boxes. And when I would sit with people who were suicidal, I'd pick up in their eyes that they were screaming at me in their eyes, even though they look kind of almost like numb. Mm -hmm. What they were screaming at me is you're checking boxes and I'm running out of time. So I threw mm -hmm. away the boxes. And so what I listened for entirely was where's the hurt, the fear, the anger, and how much time do we have before they do something destructive? It's the only thing I listened for. In fact, I listened for it so deeply Sometimes I didn't know what race or gender they were. I remember I was seeing an African-American patient and six months into seeing him, I must have said something kind of weird. He said, Mark, Mark, or Dr. Goulston, I'm black. 
I didn't know he was black. Hmm. Do you follow me? Because, because yeah. when he got in the room, the hurt, the fear, the anger, and running out of time before he did something was so powerful. And what happens, and I will tell you this to you, in your personal relationships, okay, so this may not help you as an entrepreneur, but it'll make your life better. In your personal relationships, especially in this time of the pandemic, uh, almost everyone you know has a lot of hurt, fear, and anger. And when people pick up that you're listening for it, and I wrote, a, I, I co-authored a book, my eighth book during the pandemic, and it's called Why Cope When You Can Heal. And I introduced a name for this approach called surgical empathy. And why surgical empathy? Because if you've never been suicidal, you won't understand what I'm about to say. But if you have been, you'll say he's right on. When we're traumatized in life, in order to cope with it, we don't form psychological attachments. We form psychological adhesions. It's like when you have surgery to save your life, your organs will often develop adhesions. And for the adhesions, are strangulating some of your organs, you have to go in surgically and cut the adhesions. Mm. So surgical empathy is a way to go into the psychological adhesion to death as the only way to take away the pain of hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness. And is that adhesion thing, is that like a defense mechanism? That's sort of like... Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, if you, if you think, look, if... Uh, if you've ever taken a lifesaver training at the beach or the pool, one of the things they train you on is how to, how to safely hold on to a drowning person without that drowning person bringing you both down. Right. So they're not attaching to you in a rational way saying, oh, thank you, Mr. and Ms. Lifeguard. for They're grabbing onto you. It's an adhesion. But a surgical empathy cuts through it. Actually, I'll share an anecdote because, you know, you seem to be giving me a lot of time. And, and by this time, we've probably scared away the entrepreneurs who aren't into this, but you're into it, I can tell. Yeah. So there was one woman I was seeing that was referred to me by this uh, Dr. Schneidman, who uh, Ed Schneidman is a pioneer in suicide prevention. We'll call her Nancy. She'd made several suicide attempts. And I didn't think I was helping her. And way back then, you could be in the hospital for four, five, six weeks. You know, it's not like that anymore. And so she'd been in the hospital multiple, multiple times and made three suicide attempts. And I was seeing her, but she never made really eye contact. And I didn't think I was helping her. And I was seeing her probably about six months, a couple times a week, maybe more. And I used to moonlight once a month, which means I would go into a state psychiatric hospital and cover for the psychiatrist there on the weekend. And sometimes you don't sleep for 24 hours or 30 hours. So there I am seeing Nancy on a Monday and I hadn't slept and she didn't make eye contact with me. And as I'm seated with her, I'm looking out at the room and the color turns to black and white. And then the black and white, I turns to my I get the chills and I think I'm having a stroke or a seizure hmm. so I do I'm a I'm a medical doctor so I did a neurologic exam on myself I'm tapping my knees I'm tapping my elbows I'm looking at my finger to see if I'm seeing double and it wasn't rude because she didn't look at me and everything was there I said you know no stroke no seizure and then I had this crazy idea that I was looking out at the world, feeling what she felt, that it was black and white and cold. So because I was sleep deprived, I leaned in and it got worse. And then I blurted something out that normally I wouldn't have said. And I said, Nancy, I didn't know it was so bad. And I can't help you kill yourself. But if you do, I will still think well of you. Hmm. I'll miss you. 
and maybe I'll understand why you had to, to get out of the pain. And I thought to myself, did I think that or did I say that? And then I thought, I think I just gave her permission. And that was the first time she looked at me. And I thought she was going to say, thank you for understanding. I'm overdue. And I said, Nancy, what are you thinking? And she looked at me and she held onto my eyes like I'm holding onto yours. And she said, if you can really understand why I might have to uh, kill myself to get out of the pain, maybe I won't need to. And then she smiled. Hmm. And then I grabbed onto her eyes because this was the first time we made eye contact. And I said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm not going to give you any treatments that you've already been through that really didn't work unless you ask for them. Would that be okay? And she smiled as if to say, keep talking. And then I leaned in and grabbed onto her eyes. And I said, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to find you wherever you are. And I'm going to keep you company there as long as it takes, because I don't want you to be alone there anymore. Would that be okay? And then her eyes started to water a little bit. Kind of like what happened with me and uh, the Dean of Students. But can, could you track with that, Mike? Yeah, and then what? What happened then? Well, we turned she, the corner because she yeah. felt less alone in hell. Uh, you know, after Anthony Bourdain and Kate Spade died by suicide, and this uh, it was within the same week, I wrote an article, you can find it, Why People Kill Themselves, It's Not Depression. And what I talked about is that there's, a, there's hundreds of millions of people who are depressed who don't kill themselves. There's people who lose their job or their marriage and they don't kill themselves. It contributes to it. But one of the things I recognize that nearly all suicidal people feel at the end is they feel despair. And if you break the word despair into D-E-S-P-A-I-R, it means unpaired, hopeless, unpaired with the future, helpless, powerless, useless, worthless, purposeless, meaningless. And when they all line up, pointless mm. and they pair with death to take the pain away it's like the sirens calling out to the sailors come crash on the rocks i'll take your pain away and so they pair with death to take the pain away but if they can feel felt by you which is what nancy felt they'll pair with that Just a short break here to ask you a question. Have you read my book? It's called Ownership, How Getting Selfish Got Me Unstuck, and it's available on Amazon, Audible, and everywhere else. If you're looking for inspiration that will help you unlock your greatness and potential, order or download your very own copy today. And let go of this uh, being suicidal. I'll share another insight that was kind of Can can I ask a question first, Mark? Sure. The, the, you said during that conversation you had with Nancy twice, you said, would it be okay? And then you proceeded to. So getting back to like what's important for entrepreneurs, I thought that was very, like, asking for permission, would it be okay to whatever follows is a very powerful strategy, right? Because when you say, would it be okay? You're giving someone the, the chance to say, no, it would not be okay, in which case they weren't going to be receptive to whatever you were going to say otherwise. Does that make sense? Is that what, it, what's it happening? Not, it not only makes sense, but if you're listening in to the few entrepreneurs that listen through all those stories, <laughs> I got Mike's attention. He's thinking, you got, you, you got my attention, Mark. Um, why you might want to say, would it be okay? And this is a problem that a lot of entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are often too convincing too soon. And what I coach them on is you want to be compelling to open people's minds, convincing to get them to take action. And why you might want to ask permission 
is because you want to give them the chance to choose to do something with you. Whereas what I see with a lot of tech entrepreneurs is they're so enamored with their IP and their technology, they come off as convincing too soon, which can take away the space between you and your customer or investor, and you take away their choosing to want to give you their money. So when you say, would it be okay, you're respecting them making the choice right. to want to engage with you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you for clarifying that. That's good. Um, do you mind if I shift it a little bit? It's your podcast, You man. You mentioned, um, are you a YPO member? I see it on your website. I don't know if you... It's interesting. Um, a friend of mine, Jason Reed serial entrepreneur his 14 year old son died by suicide three years ago he mm -hmm. reached out to me and we've been doing presentations we did um we did two ypo global uh presentations where he talks about the signs that he missed with his son okay how he blames himself and then i come in and talk about if you're worried about your teenager, this is how to open up. And we've okay. done presentations, the EO, uh, both in person and uh, on on virtually. So yeah, that's, okay. yes. I, I, I asked because well, I saw it on your website, but then I also, uh, I heard you at one time mention Andre Norman. And um, for, those of, uh, for those of you who don't know who Andre Norman is, he is a, a, a gentleman who was heavily involved in gangs went to prison, killed multiple people, killed people in jail, but ended up you know, having an epiphany of sorts and actually got a degree from Harvard, some sort of degree from Harvard afterwards. And now he, he goes around and he, I actually accompanied him for two days here in Milwaukee when he, he came here for YPO and I took him to three schools because he likes to, his thing, whole thing is when he goes to a community, he wants to talk to kids in high school. Um, and he, he's become, you know, I'd say very popular. I, I don't know if that's how you ran into him, Mark, but, um, but for, anyway, look up Andre Norman. He's got a tremendous story. And for, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, you pick up a guy at the airport who <laughs> you know has had the history he's had and you're a little, Kind of, kind of worried, um, but uh, but boy, oh boy, I had a great time. I spent a lot of time with him, driving him around, and then hosting him at the events. And and as I said, we went to three schools, and I just sat there and saw the kids interact with him. And what was so cool about it is when you know kids are like, ah, you know, whatever, they don't want to interact with him. They think they know it all still, and he calls them on that, right? Like, right, just very, very plain spokenly uh, to to try to get them to listen um, because listening to him is going to be a, 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 a net positive for their futures, some of them, or maybe a lot of them. So anyway, I, I, I remember hearing you talk about him. I don't know how you connected with him, but um, do you well, remember? He and, I, he and I have become partners and like brothers. So, uh, oh, okay. So, so he, uh, so he was on my podcast, Andre Norman. Yeah. And I have the same feeling about him that you did. And so I've been introducing him uh, to the Fortune 500. Mm -hmm. So one of, someone else who was on my podcast was Doug Conant. Uh, he was the CEO of Campbell's Soup. He's also the chair of chief executive for corporate purpose. And these are the 250 top CEOs of the top uh, 250 companies. And it's, it's their social philanthropy. And so I introduced Andre to Doug. Andre did a town hall meeting with Doug. And uh, in May of this year, he went to New York and he did a presentation to, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, mm. to their social responsibility people, because um, he's for real. He's, he, uh, he doesn't come off, uh, as he said to me, and he said this humbly, he said, I'm the LeBron James of racial uh, equity because mm -hmm. the black community trusts me 
and I don't shame the white community. I'm just direct. I yes. say, uh, I say, look, you want to do something about it? Let's do something. If you don't want to do something about it, that's okay. But Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter isn't going away. And you can be on the, you know, the, the uh, leading edge of it, or you can be a laggard. It's up to you. And that's how he mm. talks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So anyway, cool, cool little um, connection. I wanted to go to, you mentioned this, the mentor that you had, um, uh, the, uh, the suicide expert, but I've also heard you talk about Larry King as a mentor and being part of his breakfast club. And so I throw that out there and people are probably thinking to themselves, as I am, you're, you, you know, you're practicing psych, uh, psychiatry, UCLA, um, helping people with you know, their, their problems specifically with suicide. And then I'm thinking, how do you become a person that, you know, is having breakfast regularly with Larry King or just uh, last week, last Friday, Tim Ferriss's email has a hat tip to, to you. And, you know, I hear you talking about being on stage with Daniel Kahneman and I believe, uh, you know, South Nelson Mandela, and I've just heard all of these things, and I'm wondering to myself, how does this, and I might have that right, but anyway, I'm wondering, how does this all happen? And particularly start with Larry King. Well, I'll share something. Uh, uh, I'm a founding member of the Newsweek Expert Forum. So they're, okay. they're foraying into the business thing the way Forbes and Inc. does, you know, where you can, you can write articles. And uh, probably by the time you post this, my latest article at uh, Newsweek will be out. And it's called the, the UX trifecta, um, user experience. And so I think one of the ways that I've discovered uh, to be most compelling to open people's minds uh, is three things. You want to share something that is counterintuitive meaning they would say to themselves, uh, I, uh, I never would have thought of that. That's relevant to me. I never would have thought of that. It should be intuitively correct. That's the second step. I can use that. I can use that. That'll help me. So it's relevant to me. And then the third thing is it's doable by me. I'm going to act on it. So when you're trying to so uh, have your marketing departments that when they put out any information and marketing is what you put out that gives you the opportunity to make a sale. A lot of people confuse those, but marketing is what you put out in the world that attracts enough attention so that you have the opportunity to make a sale. And all marketing should trigger something that's counterintuitive I, I, I never would have thought of that. Intuitively correct. This is relevant to me. And the third thing is I'm going to buy that. And, uh, uh, and so here, <laughs> so how, here's an interesting first impression with Larry King. So he had a breakfast club of quirky people for 21 years and, you know, people would come in from out of town and there was like four or five regulars and uh, you'd take turns paying for it, you know. Was, when, was, uh, was Cal Fussman one of those people? Absolutely, yeah. I okay. love Cal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He moved back to the East Coast. Cal's a great guy. I love Cal. You remind me to reach out to him. Um, and so someone invited me, uh, you know, who was part of the group, uh, said, oh, you know, I meet with Larry King. You want to come to breakfast? So here's, here's what you call the UX trifecta. This, okay. I, think, I think this is a cute story. So I remember there were six of us there, two, two, two tables side by side. So I'm diagonally far away from Larry. And, and he's engaged with someone in front of him. You know, and they would banter really intensely. And this person who brought me introduced, said, oh, here's Mark. And, you know, Larry didn't really talk to me because I was distant from him. And, uh, uh, and so this is how you make a good first impression. I said, Larry, uh, uh, and they, they were getting up. I said, Larry, uh, 
you're pretty curious, aren't you? He said, I've been curious all my life. In the Brooklyn, I've been curious all my life. Yes, sure. Uh, I said, really? Uh, he said, yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, I didn't care about eating ice cream. I want to know how you make it. I said, well, that's good. I said, I have a suggestion for you. And he's kind of looking at me oddly, like, who is this guy? I don't even know this guy. I said, a couple of weeks ago, Sully Sullenberger was being interviewed um, by Lawrence uh, O'Donnell, I think, uh, the, the 11th, uh, whatever the guy is, the last word, with uh, whatever his name is. Uh, and, uh, and he was referring to Trump as incurious. And he was, and he was saying, I, and what Sully Sullenberg was saying is, uh, I don't know uh, if uh, President Trump can learn because he's not curious. He's incurious. Hmm. So Larry's looking at me and the table's looking at me. I said, here's an idea for you. Um, you're going to go and print up two caps. You're going to have Sully Sullenberger on your show. You're going to print up two caps. And they're each going to say M-A-C-A, not M-A-G-A. You're going to put one of the hats on and you're going to say to Sully, Sully, why don't we start a campaign? Make America curious again. And you're going to give him the cap and he'll be all over that in a heartbeat. And then the person Larry was bantering with looks at Larry, looks at me, looks at Larry and he says, Larry, do you know how brilliant that idea is? And then Larry smiles at me. He said, you can come to breakfast every day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you make a good first impression. But do you see how that's counterintuitive? I never yeah. would have thought of that. It's intuitively correct. Boy, I think that would work. And it was doable. He didn't do it because, you know, you know, he was caught up in something else. But that's what you want to do. If you're listening in, you're an entrepreneur. You want to be able to do that. Uh, something I will mention, which you haven't mentioned, is for a year and a half, I've done a bunch of things. I did a one-man show playing Steve Jobs coming back from the dead. So I you had, did. I did. There's videos up on YouTube. So there's a turtleneck, the 501 jeans, the the, uh, the horn rim glasses. And the whole purpose of it was to tee up a formula that Steve Jobs discovered and it's the secret formula that makes him and Elon Musk a, uh, a visionary. And the formula is you want to show people in your marketing something that triggers in them, wow, hmm, yes. Wow, hmm, Sorry about the siren. That's okay. That so, happens. So, and, so, and here's an example. And so when I when I played him, I taught and I played him coming back from coming back to Apple in 1996 till 2007. And I said when he discovered the graphical user interface at Xerox Park, and there's a video. If you're listening in or viewing, look up National Geographic Xerox Park Steve Jobs. You'll see a dramatization where he discovers the graphical user interface, the mouse, and you, you look at the expression on his face and you'll see he goes, wow, hmm, yes. The wow is he can't believe what he's seen. The hmm is he says, uh, he looks at Wozniak, what do you think? And Wozniak says, once they go there, they're not going back. And then the yes is uh, they didn't know what to do with it at Xerox Park he went back to Apple and created the Macintosh and he did the same thing with the uh, announcement of the iPhone. It's a phone. It's an, uh, it's an, I, uh, uh, it's an iPod. It's an internet connecting device. Right. And he says it several times and he says, these are not three separate entities. I give you the iPhone so he created in people the wow, hmm, yes. And Apple, every time they announce a new product, Elon Musk does that with Tesla. You want to be able to create in your market 
that experience. Wow, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Hmm, this is too good to ignore. Yes, I see what I can do with this, sold. Yeah. What made you want to do that, Mark? What made you want to... Do the one-man show? Yeah, do the one-man show, yeah. Well, I've done, uh, you know, for years, I've intermittently done presentations to um, uh, Vistage groups, YPO, uh, EO. And mm-hmm. I, was doing, I was doing a presentation to uh, a, a group called uh, Advanced, I forget it, but uh, there's about 10 of them up and down in California. And, uh, and I was doing presentations on listening and I'm a pretty good storyteller. And, uh, and I remember uh, the, uh, the founder of it, uh, Mimi Grant, she said, you got pretty good ratings uh, after the first one, I was talking about listening and she said, you're going to come back and do one for one of the other groups. And I said, uh, I said, good, but I'm going to do a different, a different topic. And she said, but you did so well with the first one. I said, I lucked out. I said, trust me on this. And she looked at me and I don't, I don't lie. Uh, and so the next one, I, uh, I talked about this, wow, hmm, yes thing. And someone said, you just figured out Steve Jobs. So then the third presentation, I explained how Steve Jobs went through it. And then the fourth presentation, I started channeling Steve Jobs. And someone said to me in that group, because there were about 10 groups, you know, you got to decide whether you want to give information or you want to do give entertainment. And he looked at me, he said, and you know, the one you want to give. Mm, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah. after that, I just started presenting as Steve Jobs. Got it. And, and just like I could look at the world through Nancy's eyes, you know, I learned to be able to look at the world through Steve Jobs' eyes. Mm. It makes me wonder, listening to you, do you think that Elizabeth Holmes watched your video? She's the Theranos uh, woman. That, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with I, her. I'm not, it, it, look, it, it had a very short run, and, <laughs> and there were small crowds. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious. Hey, everyone. If you like what I'm doing with this podcast and want to participate in more of the things I'm thinking about and exploring, subscribe to my newsletter today. It's super simple. Just go to MikeMalatesta.com right now, put in your email, and you will get the very next issue. It's short, thoughtful, and designed to inspire, activate, and maximize the greatness in you. So let's, um, we're kind of up against our time here, Mark. I'm wondering, I, I sort of talked about it at the very beginning. I don't think I can let you leave without asking you about how Superbad came to be, or at least parts of it came to be filmed at your home. How did, how did that happen? So we live in a, uh, we live in a part of Los Angeles called Brentwood. Oh, and that's uh, OJ lived in Brentwood, if, as I recall. Well, the, you know, years ago. I, I was on the, I, I was part of the OJ trial. I worked with the prosecution. I remember you talking about that. Oh, that's, yeah. a, whole other, that's a whole other show. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe yeah, we'll do that show. In fact, we can do that because uh, um, I do a talk about never be bullied again. And I talk about being confront, uh, being confronted by F. Lee Bailey. That's a whole other story. Oh, um, can we do another? Can we do that? Would you be willing to do yeah, something yeah, just yeah, on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah that'd be I, fun. Yeah, if we want to do that. So, um, so they, so sometimes the uh, 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 location people are looking for houses, mm-hmm. and uh, and so one of my wife, she's a full time mom and grandma, and she's a she's wonderful. I, I hit the lottery with her, but one of her little hobbies is, you know, uh, if someone wants to, you know, use our house for a location, and so. Uh, uh, so this uh, movie company comes over with a guy named Judd Apatow. Never heard of him. Mm-mm, and no. Jonah Hill. And uh, uh, and uh, and I was away uh, working in the East Coast. 
and and they use the location for two weeks. And I didn't know this, but if they use your house for 13 days, it's tax free as a location. Uh-huh. So that uh, that helped pay for a couple tuitions uh, those 13 days. And I remember my wife was saying, uh, you know, asking one of the not the main director. So what's the show about? And they said, oh, I don't know. It's probably going to go straight to video. Mm. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. And so they film. They film the final ten or fifteen minutes uh, of Superbad in in my home. And here's a, here's a silly, stupid story. So about a year and a half ago, I joined Clubhouse. You know the yeah, audio. Okay. Thing. The audio app. Yeah. And uh, and and because you know, and you, and you put up pictures. And so what I put up, I put up a picture of one of the super bad characters named McLovin. And McLovin was this nerdy kid who finally has sex. And so my, my clubhouse picture was a picture of McLovin sitting on our bed just after he'd had sex. And then I got all this, I got all this pushback from clubhouse. They say, Mark, you bet. You look like a child molester. You better get rid of that picture. You know, so <laughs> I, you know. So when you see something out of context, um, but uh, but it was funny, and they use that, and uh, so that's the super bad story. Nice. Well, that goes to your, um, you, you know, that first thing that you said. You know, you say something or do something that's counterintuitive, or say something counterintuitive, right? So that picture was counterintuitive of you as a. Mm-hmm. So here's a tip if you're uh, in transition and you're trying to define what your unique value proposition is. Um, there's a saying that people are more impressed by excellence than what you're excellent at. You don't have to like basketball, but you could still be impressed by Steph Curry. You don't sure. like you don't have to like golf and still be formally impressed by Tiger Woods. So what I suggest to people who are trying to distill what their unique value proposition is is to reach out to people you've worked with in the past 2-3 years, not before that, who you believe saw you as excellent. And excellent means you were consistently better than very good. And you consistently exceeded their expectations. So identify who those people are and you reach out to them. And in the subject line of whatever the email or text is, I'd like to buy 15 minutes of your time. Now, these people, except the real, you know, sort of a-holes are going to say, you don't have to buy. What's this about? And what you say is, unless I was mistaken, it seemed to me that you felt that I was excellent because you told me that. And I just worked hard to help you. But I'm trying to drill down what it was that I was excellent about in your eyes. I'm trying to distill what that is, but I take your time seriously and I want to pay for it. And these people, you know, are going to give you the 15 minutes or you pay them for it. But what will happen psychologically is they will share things that you did with them that they now remember. And when they're remembering it, they're re-experiencing how appreciative and grateful and wild they were by you in the conversation. They'll relive it. And then what you say to them is, what would you call that besides, you know, works hard? uh, And what industry do you think most needs that. And it's just a matter of me getting in front of that industry or that company. And they'd be able to tell you what that is. But if you do this with enough people and you've been that respectful and willing to pay them for their time, I would say about a quarter of those people after that conversation with you are going to say, let me make a call. Because if you're excellent, they can reach out to someone they know in an industry Uh, And one of the ways I make introductions to people, I make two introductions a day, is I'll reach out to people from my podcasts and say, as part of my relationship with you, is when I run into people that are truly excellent, I feel it's my responsibility to let you know that I know these people. 
And I'm not telling them that I'm hitting on you for them, but I just ran into someone who's the best oncologist, the best veterinarian, uh, the best strategist, the best whatever. And uh, and here's a li- and if you want, I'll send you a link. And if you want an introduction, I'll introduce the two of you. Mm-hmm. So you're building incredible goodwill, and you de- uh, and you develop a group of people that you deem to be excellent. So one of the things that I we didn't talk about that I seem to be excellent is is uh, conflict resolution. Because what I've discovered is the majority of people avoid conflict in business, unless they're a bully. Bullies cause conflict; they don't avoid they don't avoid it. But most other people put off firing someone, confronting someone, and so I'm one of the best known conflict mastery coaches. So. Uh, so I'm not just going to go in there and resolve the conflict at my age. I'll say, well, we can do that, but I'm going to help you master any conflict you're facing because you're not just avoiding conflict with your business partner. You're avoiding conflict with your, uh, with your brother or sister or such and such. And it's eating you up. Right. And let's work together so that you can confront any conflict and so people are now introducing me to people who they know have a conflict. Is there a conflict you're avoiding? Yeah. Uh, does it ever eat you up at night where you can't even sleep? Oh, yeah, all the time. Uh, why? Why are you asking? Because I've run into someone who is who teaches people how to finally confront any conflict they have. Right. So, so do you, do you, follow, get, how, yeah. you follow how that works? I do. Um, in fact, as you were saying that, so I've, I haven't done exactly that. What you did was what you suggested doing was I think more valuable than what I've done. I've done something similar. I call it grateful for your thoughts. I've done this twice over 20 years and I've reached out to that group, same sort of group that you're talking about people who know me, but don't rely on me. They're not looking at me for a check or something. And I ask them, what am I good at? Help me understand where I provide the most value. And I also ask them, and if there's areas where, I do something that actually takes away from the value, my value proposition. Tell me that too. Um, and it's been great. I collect the information back. Most people are very willing to to help me with that. Some want to, you know, talk to me. Some just want to email, you know, but I collect all of that. And then I, I look at it introspectively and I say, okay, um, you know, am I on the path that I want to be on? Am I making the difference I want to make or, what, or so is there something getting in the way of that, that I can address that I can't see myself or I want to avoid and, and hope that other people don't see it, even though I recognize that it's there. Um, yeah, that was really good. I, I, I think that's wonderful. Uh, um, you, 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 can, you can try either, but, but in terms of getting people's attention, if there's someone who thinks favorably towards you and you haven't been in touch with them, I think if you say, uh, if you send them a message, uh, uh, hi, uh, I, I'd, li- I'd like to buy 15 minutes of your time. Yeah, I like your approach better. I'm just going to be clear about that. That's like a very compelling, no one asks to buy your time. Yeah. They just don't do it, right? Yeah. Right. They ask to pick your brain and people go, oh, jeez. But yeah, buy your time is way different. Yeah, so you're respecting. And, and, and if they had a good experience with you, you know, only the real, you know, jerks are going to say, okay, yeah, my time is uh, $10,000 an hour. So it's $2,500 for 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mark. Dr. Goulston, thank you so much for being on my show. Um, this has been a real joy getting to know you and, and getting the education that you provided as well. It's really interesting to sort of go back and forth on that. Um, I said where to find you at the beginning. Is there anything you want to add here at the end so that people can can hook up with you? Uh, MarkGoulston.com is relatively up to date. LinkedIn, I'm keeping uh, uh, pretty much up to date. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, I don't do much on Facebook uh, for some reason or other. Yeah, uh, me neither. Yeah, there's just only so much I can do. Um, and uh, my wake up call, 
is available uh, on nearly all podcast uh, uh, platforms. Yeah, and, listen to that, uh, people. And I'm and I'm going to be launching something, but I can't tell you what it is. But if you're going to have me back on the show, it might be launched by the time uh, you have me back. Okay. All right. So you leave us hanging. I like it. Perfect. There leave us go. wanting more. Okay, Mark, thank you so much. You're welcome. And and I'll leave with what uh, the Tim Ferriss quote. Yes. Because that was a long tangent. So um, I saw that he liked quotes. And so you can reach him on Twitter. Yeah. And so I said, I saw that you like quotes. And here's my favorite quote of all time. And I collect a lot of them. And the quote I credit to a woman named Dr. Shawnee Duperon. And it said, forgiveness is accepting the apology you will never receive. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to him and he's got a zillion followers, but I got a tweet back from him, you know, uh, saying this is very, very helpful. And then two or three weeks later, he made that uh, his quote of the week, which yes. means it, I'm, I'm sure that got through to him. I'm sure he thought to himself, this is counterintuitive. I never would have thought of that. This makes so much sense. I'm going to do it. I mean, I'd love to get on his show to see how he followed up on it because sure. I, it obviously hit a nerve with him, but who knows? Yeah. It's a wow. Hmm. I'm going to use that. That's right. Yeah. All right, Mark. Well, yeah, my friend, thank you so much. Thank you.